Hi, uh, I'm Lakshmi Nasima. Uh, I'm a full stack developer, and uh, I didn't take any database courses. Uh, I became a web developer by the quick route, so that means I don't know a lot about databases, all the super duper advanced stuff uh, I encountered yesterday. So. Much better, thank you. Um, yeah, but I'm still improving. Uh, I hope uh, I don't put people to sleep. <laughs> uh, and I'm always finding um, uh, ways to uh, ship uh, web apps faster. So I've been a web developer for uh, most of my uh, life. Uh, so, um, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to build a REST API on top of your database. Uh, let's just forget the database for a moment. Uh, let's just uh, assume that you have to build a REST API. So how do you go about doing that? Um, you'll pick a framework of your uh, choice, uh, the coolest framework, which is hip now. And uh, you'll start uh, writing away opening your ID, uh, you'll import a lot of libraries. Uh, frameworks do have a lot of advantages. Uh, they're easy to get off the ground. Uh, even a developer like me can actually uh, uh, ship an API in about a day or two just by learning about uh, how, uh, how I call all the functions and all that. I need not know the underlying concepts. Uh, they're, they're actually built for uh, such use cases. And uh, they help you avoid the uh, decision-making fatigue involved in creating an application. Uh, you need not uh, spend your time um, choosing uh, one option over the other. They already have all the sensible uh, defaults baked in. So you're all set. Uh, but uh, it's not without its uh, problems. Um, at one point, uh, a web app uh, encounters this wall where uh, you want to customize and you end up fighting the framework and uh, your code starts to bloat. And uh, that's a lot of code actually if you want to write a framework. Uh, if you take any modern framework today and then you write a framework, it'll come with its own uh, flavor of uh, a code bundler, importer. That's a lot of code to hold in your head a lot of code to update, maintain. So it comes with a lot of baggage. Uh, so this is, this is where uh, a tool called Postgres enters. Uh, I'm going to address all the disadvantages uh, what we had with frameworks. At the same time, uh, we get the best of both worlds. Uh, we get off the ground quickly and uh, in a minimal uh, fashion as well. Um, it, it is a tool. Uh, we'll go into the details uh, further. Uh, I'll just give an intro about what Postgres is. Um, it is a tool which will help you uh, convert your uh, database instantly into a REST API. Um, you will end up with a more uh, cleaner and uh, standards compliant uh, REST API than whatever you would write with your own framework. They also have all the sensible defaults baked in. Um, you just have to uh, import your schema into the database and then you're all set, as we'll see in the demo. Uh, you need not uh, you know, run any uh, web service or write any code except, except your schema. Um, it is very simple. Uh, uh, it adheres to the KISS simple, uh, principle uh, very much. And uh, it's easy to scale as well. Uh, you need not... Uh, you know, think a lot about uh, how to scale your uh, web app, though it's a good problem to have. Uh, you just uh, throw in more uh, Postgres uh, clusters or uh, add more uh, Postgres nodes, and then you're done with your scaling. You can do scaling both on the horizontal and the vertical dimensions. Uh, before uh, we go into the details, I, I want to um, elaborate on the concept of uh, not using a backend at all. Uh, it exactly doesn't mean that uh, we don't use backends anymore. It's just that the concept of a backend is slowly getting abstracted away 
from uh, uh, web development. Uh, we take a lot of things for granted, like uh, user login, uh, CRUD. You just have a bunch of entities for your web app, and uh, you do CRUD around it, and then you have authentication. That's what 80% of web apps are all about. That's what uh, WordPress or Drupal or anything is all about. So uh, why reinvent all this stuff again when you're writing a framework? You can as well uh, get them uh, done without any thinking. So that's the concept of a no ba a backend. Uh, so uh, we see a, a increasing trend of uh, no backend coming into uh, action uh, nowadays. Uh, one example is uh, GraphQL, which is an abstraction over uh, uh, querying a huge database like uh, Facebook's, where uh, you just specify the details of what you want and then you get it. Uh, uh, you're not aware of uh, what goes behind the scenes and all that. So there is sort of no back end there. And uh, your front end is getting more and more uh, detailed and uh, elaborate uh, by the day because uh, there are the same data is being uh, uh, consumed and displayed in various uh, forms like your uh, mobile device, your uh, computer, your uh, screen ticker, a lot of lot of forms, but the same content. So uh, this shows that uh, there is an increasing trend towards uh, abstracting the backend away. Uh, so Postgres uh, conforms to the uh, philosophy of no backend. Uh, it helps you, in fact, uh, code applications, uh, and uh, you can pretend that there is no backend at all and get started. Uh, the way Postgres works is uh, it is written in Haskell. Uh, it is a thin uh, web application interface, which is a, a fancier form of CGI, uh, which sits between your uh, uh, web server and your database. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, there's nothing to configure, there's nothing to install and all that. It's just a simple executable. Uh, it follows the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it really well. Uh, these are the... Uh, options which you need to uh, configure to run Postgres. Uh, uh, you just need to specify a role, and then whatever schema you're going to expose to the uh, public, and then whatever port you're going to run. Uh, I'll come back to the JWT secret in a while. That's it. Uh, you can pretty much get started in uh, your favorite platform. It, it, it comes for uh, Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, the the concept here is uh, all REST semantics can be mapped to your uh, DB semantics. Uh, your tables or views in your database they map to a REST route, and uh, all the CRUD operations they have their place in the database as well. Your post becomes an insert, uh, get becomes a select. And then get with uh, params becomes a select with a where condition. And patch is approximated update. And put is absurd. And delete is your delete. Um, you can also handle pagination and uh, ranges using limit and offset. Uh, these will be set in the header. I'll be showing that in a short while. And uh, authentication is handled by the concept of user roles. Uh, why should we use Postgres for uh, this? We could as well use any uh, relational database backend, right? So what is so special about Postgres? Uh, Postgres is more versatile compared to other uh, database. At least that's what I find. It's the Emacs of databases. Uh, it's got support for a lot of uh, data types. And uh, REST, uh, the lingua franca of REST is uh, JSON, and uh, JSON is a first-class citizen in Postgres. And uh, this uh, background image is a Google Trend uh, chart, which I took a snapshot of yesterday. It shows that uh, XML is uh, decreasing in uh, usage, and JSON is increasing um, as we speak. So uh, there are a lot of advantages uh, for JSON. Uh, 
Um, it's a lot less verbose than uh, XML, so your payload is a lot leaner. Um, it is native JavaScript. Um, most of your uh, uh, REST consumers are uh, JavaScript, so it's easier to uh, get, a, get a hold of it and parse it. So um, that's one of the reasons why we use Postgres. And uh, the other one is programmability. Uh, you can uh, pretty much uh, write extensions and functions in your favorite language. It supports Ruby, uh, JavaScript, uh, your PLSQL as well, Python. Um, so uh, this pretty much means that you can write a lot of uh, business logic in your database itself and store them as uh, stored procedures. Uh, contrary to the uh, popular myth that uh, stored procedures make your uh, application all hairy and all that, that doesn't have to be the case. So uh, uh, there is this uh, paradigm of fat models and thin controllers where uh, your model stores all the business logic and uh, your controller just acts as a thin wheel between um, your views and your uh, data models in an MVC architecture. So uh, we'll see how to create a successful REST API. Uh, using Postgres. Uh, before we go into that, any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. It's more important that I get this concept across than finish the presentation in time. I should have said that in the beginning, probably. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a given today that you have to uh, expose your uh, uh, public-facing uh, REST API only through SSL because uh, Wi-Fi is so ubiquitous today, it's very easy to uh, intercept your uh, uh, HTTP requests and then uh, you know hijack your data. So uh, we should always try to use uh, SSL. Um, in uh, like I said, Postgres follows the Unix philosophy. Uh, it doesn't handle the SSL part of it. Uh, you can though do it using uh, nginx where you tweak in the SSL parts and then Postgres is totally oblivious of it. Um, we use uh, versioning of APIs a lot. It's a must because APIs keeps on changing and uh, your consumer uh, uh, doesn't want to end up with a broken uh, REST API because your uh, data has changed or the payload has changed. So versioning helps you avoid all those uh, hash splitting moments. Um, versioning is implemented in Postgres. Uh, it was implemented previously by using different schemas. Like for example, schema A would contain, uh, would serve a different version and schema B would serve uh, some other version of the database. Um, but now, uh, again, uh, adhering to the uh, minimalist philosophy, it's been uh, offloaded to Nginx where uh, you, you run Postgres for different schemas as two different processes in different ports. And then uh, you route the request via Nginx to the respect to port whenever you get a request. Um, this works for both uh, uh, version information in the path as well as in your uh, request headers. Um, this is one more reason why uh, Postgres is a good backend for uh, a REST API. Uh, you can handle the authentication in the database itself using uh, the PG crypto extension. We'll see how that is done. Um, we use a standard called uh, uh, JSON Web Tokens. Um, it is an open standard for uh, uh, you know, uh, managing claims between two parties, the client and the server. So whenever uh, a user logs in and uh, they, they send a token along with the request, and uh, this token is validated in your uh, Postgres application. And then uh, your Postgres database actually uses that role for that HTTP request and then does the transaction. So this is, your, uh, this is how your authentication is done in Postgres. Uh, there are a lot of other benefits to uh, JSON web tokens as well. Um, unlike uh, your typical uh, session-based uh, tokens, 
uh, there is just one uh, JWT key for every Postgres which will uh, be there in the database. So that's a lot less lookups. And uh, all your uh, authentication is actually offloaded to the client. So each client handles uh, its own authentication. So that's, that's a lot of uh, load away from the server. Um, we also implement the concept of row level security in uh, Postgres. It, it means that uh, users using the same table, they don't step on each other's toes. They don't uh, do a crud on other users' uh, rows. Uh, though uh, row level security is possible only in a 9.5, uh, we we can um, emulate it uh, in uh, versions prior to that. Uh, it's detailed in this blog post. Uh, another uh, increasing um, requirement for REST API is that uh, it should be self-describing, um, or uh, the technical uh, mumbo jumbo for that is HTOS, uh, which means that. Uh, uh, your uh, API uh, service should be automatically discoverable by the consumer. Uh, though it's, uh, 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 it's not a very good substitute for uh, good uh, documentation, um, it helps if your API has got a self-describing uh, feature. Postgres supports this by uh, using the options request, where if you hit the root, uh, it will show you all the resources which are available in the database for you to uh, transact with. So that's a rudimentary sort of uh, HTOS which is provided by Postgres. There are uh, a lot of uh, planned features like uh, um, RAML support baked into your uh, Postgres schema. Uh, what it will do is it will uh, take your database, uh, uh, parse it, pass the metadata and then generate an RML file out of it. It's a planned feature, it's not there yet. Um, one more uh, requirement is uh, you only have to uh, fetch whatever data you really want, uh, like GraphQL. Um, in most cases, you query uh, the API and then you get a huge boatload of uh, uh, JSON payload. You have to sift your way through that, parse it, and then get what you want. But uh, here, that's not the case. We can specify uh, whatever columns which need to be returned. You, know, you can do it both horizontally and vertically, both dimensions. Um, for example, you can do something like this. Uh, select only the age, height, and weight columns from the people resource. Um, you can also drill down your uh, JSON using your uh, typical uh, stock Postgres operators. Um, for example, in the employee's uh, resource, you can get the third item and then get the element whose ID is equal to two. I think this is something which you cannot do in a normal REST query. There are a lot of other cool stuff as well. Mm. You can do bulk inserts by setting the content type uh, in the headers to text CSV and then do a post with uh, the CSV content. You can also do bulk updates, um, bulk patches that is. So this is an example where you mark all these people whose age is less than 13 as child. I don't know why the formatting is a bit off there. So what are the use cases of uh, something like this? How do we apply this in a real world scenario? Um, you can... Uh, You can um, instantly convert a legacy uh, database into an API uh, just by exposing parts of it or creating a new schema for that. Um, this is a very good uh, backend for uh, single page uh, web applications. 
where uh, you just need the data, you can consume it and then uh, create a JavaScript single page app. Uh, if you're building a mobile backend, uh, you just need uh, Postgres and uh, the database, that's it. Um, you can consume your uh, data using the REST API. Um, you can build your own um, parts like backend uh, using this and uh, PG Notify, uh, where you can um, install uh, notifiers whenever the data is updated. So you get your own sort of rudimentary push, uh, publish, subscribe uh, notifications. There are a lot of similar tools. Uh, one is post GraphQL. Uh, it follows the same ideology, except that uh, your uh, database query can be constructed into a GraphQL query. Um, there is one more called PG REST. It uses uh, Node.js to expose your whole Postgres as a REST API. Uh, it's not without its limitations uh, because uh, we directly expose the uh, relational database layer in uh, uh, REST. Uh, we cannot do a nested query because uh, relational data is flat, so you, it doesn't allow nested queries like these, though REST was meant to be flat by nature. And uh, you can execute stored procedures uh, in Postgres, if your procedure name is like foo, you can do something like uh, uh, post slash rpc slash foo. Uh, the only problem is uh, all the RPCs, irrespective of uh, whether they mutate your data or not, they are posts. Uh, this is something which we have to live with. Uh, the reason being, uh, uh, you, you can't uh, do them as a get or a post based on the mutability. Uh, this was uh, one of the issues which was discussed in the uh, threads. Uh, you can try Postgres DOM. Uh, there is a Docker image ready-made which is available. You just have to download it, tweak it, and then get it up and running. Um, it can also be done on AWS. Uh, RDS supports 9.5 now, and then um, probably you can tweak it with AWS Lambda and then create your own uh, web app with that. Uh, it runs on Heroku as well. Uh, I'm not sure if Heroku supports 9.5, does it? Yeah. It does? Cool. Last time I checked it didn't. Um, let's do a demo. Is that good enough?
So uh, I've imported uh, the schema here. I, I'll, I'll be checking the schema uh, in uh, GitHub. Um, let me just show it. So this is your schema. Uh, this will be a simple uh, to-do app. Uh, it's got uh, user authentication plus a table called uh, to-dos with uh, uh, its own uh, role-level security implemented. So uh, this means that I'll uh, be able to insert, uh, read, update, and delete into uh, to-do table, and uh, other people won't be able to see my to-dos and so on. Uh, I imported this schema right now. Um, so let me start Postgres. I, I guess the font is too big. So you can see that I'm starting Postgres with uh, a JWT secret key. Uh, this is the own key which uh, will be uh, used to validate against your uh, token. This is stored only on the server. Um, Let's just take it for a spin. Um, so let's sign up two users. So we have two users now. Uh, for using the to-do app. And uh, there is nothing in the to-do app actually, in the table. So let's add some uh, stuff to the table. Before that, we'll have to log in. So you can see that uh, I call the uh, remote procedure called login. Before that, I call the remote procedure called sign up. So I uh, I pushed a new to-do here as the first user. So there'll be one entry here. Um, now let me uh, log in as the other user and add like uh, 20 to-dos. Uh, because uh, uh, JWT is client side, there is no such operation as logout. Uh, if you want, you can implement it by invalidating the JWT token. So this is user 2's uh, to do. Um, let me add a few more. Uh, when I query for the to do's, I'll just be able to see my to do's. So there's just 21 to-dos. Uh, these are just uh, user two's to-dos. Uh, he won't be able to see the other users to do. Um, you can do uh, rest style filtering here, like uh, um, I've done a query where uh, uh, the percentage is actually uh, uh, 
written as a star when doing a, a REST query because uh, you can't use a percentage in the URL. It's interpreted wrongly. Uh, you can see that uh, it is fetching a title which has got the number 18 here. Um, I can order my uh, results using this syntax. So it uh, sorts the results b uh, by decreasing order of uh, created timestamps. So I get my last created uh, to do on the top. Sorry. And uh, you you add uh, um, range and uh, offset in the headers so that uh, you can do uh, limiting and pagination. So it's fetched only the first four items. Um, if we examine the token here, Let's try to validate this token using a, a JWT service. So it says an invalid signature here because we didn't give the secret key. That's uh, that's a secret key with a very good entropy according to at least XKCD. So all good. Um, uh, you can do just uh, select of the oh hold on I just skipped a skip. Uh, you can actually uh, modify your uh, data live without any downtime. Uh, and expect it to show up in your next query. So I'm adding a table called uh, complete status to my to-do with a default value of false. And uh, I can query that. So it just fetches the title and the complete fields for uh, my data and uh, uh, let's let's do this let's try to log in using uh, some invalid credential and we'll see what happens it says that your uh, authentication has failed So I'm, if I'm logging as user one now, I'll be able to see only my to-dos. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, the question is, why should I see only my to-dos? Correct. Uh, if you go to uh, if you sign into facebook you don't want to see your friends notifications uh, your uh, jwt token is sent in the header which will uh, be verified against the role and uh, done accordingly yeah uh, did that answer your question Uh, uh, when the request comes to Postgres, uh, it uh, passes the uh, JWT like I showed you in that site and then fetches your role. So you can see here that uh, it's decoded here and then it says that, okay, this is the user email and this is the user's role. And then uh, it assumes that role for the transaction. And when it queries the to-dos, when you do a get, uh, it will do a filter as in uh, role equals so and so and author is uh, user uh, two at example.com and then only fetch those to do's that's how that's what happens behind the scenes 
get it? Cool. So uh, let's patch a uh, to do. Have we logged in? Yes. So I, I create a new to do here. Um, let me. So we have that here, the last one. That's ID number twenty four. Um, I'm updating that. Twenty four, not twenty five. So you can see that uh, it is updated to two thousand seventeen, and uh, similarly you can do a delete, and so on and so forth. That's it. I'm done. Any questions? Yeah. Um, there are sites which run this in production. Uh, it's there in the website. Yeah, I just I'm running a pet project. I'm actually yeah. creating a new to-do app. Uh, uh, it's it's more of a org mode for your browser. Uh, I'm using. Uh, it's a very uh, this is a simplified version of whatever I'm doing right now. Since you're developing against it, not just building it, uh, do you find that the lack of scanning is constraining people to come to you? Or uh, I had this problem where I had to fetch uh, hierarchical uh, data. Like, uh, if you if you fetch a node in org, it follows a hierarchy. It can contain nested lists. So uh, I wrote my own uh, procedures there. Uh, I, I even have a blog post which details how I did that. Any other questions? Sorry, I didn't get you. Can you can you make policies which are not visible to certain roles? Uh, the question is, uh, can you make certain columns uh, invisible, as as how you do with rows, correct? Yeah. So uh, if it is possible in Postgres, it should be possible here. But I don't know whether it's possible in Postgres because I'm a newbie. <laughs> Is there a column level security equivalent? Cool, then you should be able to do it. Uh, versioning is actually, the question is uh, more about versioning, right? Uh, versioning is uh, a very debated aspect in REST API because of the way it is implemented. Some people, there, there are these two schools. Uh, one is you have to have the versioning information in the URL, uh, but the argument against it is resource is a resource irrespective of uh, whatever version it is, so it should be in the headers. So what you do is uh, you have uh, different schemas of the two flavors running in your database, and then uh, I there is. Uh, Yeah. So, uh, and in Nginx, you uh, you pass the request and then figure out what headers or what path it is, and then route your. Uh, uh, I'll just show the Nginx configuration for uh, this demo. Mm, so that's it. This is pretty much. Uh, so you you can do something similar. Uh, I'll probably update this uh, README and then put it in the repo. So uh, it'll it'll be routed to the Postgres uh, node, whatever that is running accordingly.
you can specify a schema when you start Postgres actually. No, uh, you can specify the schema using a flag. But for you as a developer, when you want to do a new version of the API, you add that variable. Yeah. yeah. I create a new schema like v2, and then uh, create my views and all that. And then I, I run a new Postgres node with that schema, v2. Yeah. And then I add a new entry in my Nginx. And Got it. Serve it. Um, sorry? Uh, the Docker image is the Postgres image, uh, but I'll be putting the code samples in a GitHub repo. So this is the link for that, the last point. It's a self-referential presentation. <laughs> uh, no Backend is an interesting uh, site. You can check that out. Uh, they have a lot of radical views on why you should not have a backend. That's it, guys. Thank you.